Welcome to Art and Scroll Studio. I'm Shelley Werner and the host of our Zoom series where we feature the makers and creators of Judaica art. October 6, 2021, our special guest was Isaac Brinjigard Bialik. He shared with us the backstory behind his amazing art. What follows is the full episode. Be sure to subscribe to our channel so you can know when we post new videos for upcoming events as well as full episodes that have happened in the past. So first I want to ask you just a few questions. Did you want to be an artist when you were young? <laughs> I wanted to be a lifeguard. Oh. Uh, I, I'm sure somewhere I have pictures that I drew of me being this lifeguard. That was my goal from kindergarten on. Um, even when I was deathly afraid of uh, swimming, <laughs> because I was concerned there would be sharks in the deep end that would come up and get me. Uh, no, I was I was destined for other things, um, or at least that's what I thought. I went to college to be a writer, and it was only there that I discovered graphic design, which became a stepping stone to art. So no, this is a, this is a later in life uh, thing that I discovered. So there you go. That's something to give people hope. So perhaps if you haven't discovered your artistic uh, elements, you could come to it later in life. But here's a question that I know is on everyone's mind who has seen any of the promotional materials. Were you comic crazy when you were young? Were you a nerd who sat in the darkened room and your mother yelled at you that it was the sun was shining and you were a comic guy? So, I mean, I've always read comic books. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I probably... If I didn't learn to read from them, I certainly learned with them. I've always been interested in them, uh, whether it was the old classics illustrated that you could sort of pretend were educational or Archie comics, uh, the superhero stuff, certainly. I've been reading those for my entire life and I still read them today. I love the comic book superhero movies. Uh, I'm into all kinds of that nerd geek culture stuff. Uh, I've dragged the kids in their cosplay outfits to various conventions. Uh, we make a big deal at a free comic book day. Heck, we make a big deal at a talk like a pirate day. So we might just be big nerds around here. So I knew I have to ask you this. This wasn't even in my plan, but when I have this image of you reading and you swimming in the deep end, I mean, what's your superpower? Like, do you have one? Oh yeah, uh, cutting paper. For sure. <laughs> of course, of course. All right, you are. I, I hope you actually use a knife for that and not your extended uh, anything you've grown. Here's, yeah. How long, we're going to look at some of your work, we're going to get there shortly, but how long does it typically take to complete a piece? Paper cutting is laborious, I know that. Do you have to start again very often or do you have happy accidents and go with it? Those are so totally different questions, right? First, there's the how long it takes to work on a piece. And I will tell you, there are certain pieces that just come together so organically. I will be thinking about something. I will sit down and sketch a little. And within moments, I've got the kernel of what it's going to be. I immediately start cutting and I will just, you know, three, four hours, you know, just nonstop and I'll have a nice little piece. So that can go really quickly. On the other hand, there are pieces that I struggle for months with trying to find the form, trying to find the way to, you know, sort of address the storylines that I'm playing with, the way that I can structure this two dimensional art form um, that can take me months and months and months. And the bigger the piece, the longer it takes as well. Um, as for whether I start over or not, I view this as a collaborative act between me and the knife. So I usually get to decide what's going to happen. I have a plan, as I said, very often, you know, I'm starting in the sketchbook. Uh, and so I have an idea of where I want to go. But then once I start cutting, sometimes the knife disagrees with my direction. And I find that a cut that I did not intend to make has already been made or something that I wanted to do early on. I've changed my mind about. So no, when things go differently than I expected, I try to go in that direction. I assume the knife has a reason for what it's doing, and I'm willing to follow. I love it. So it's really a sort of a, a symbiotic process between you, your hand, the knife, your mind, your eye, the color. And my bet is that you get very engrossed and you can work for hours. That's my, my guess. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There are certainly those nights and too many to count 
where I have, uh, you know, told my wife, oh yeah, I'm just gonna, I just need to finish up a few little things here. Like I, I, I've got an idea for this space. And then all of a sudden it's, it's two or three in the morning and she comes down, you know, with the dog. She's like, where, where are you? What are you doing? And I, I feel like, you know, oh, no time has passed, but clearly hours have. Well, yeah, I can get very engrossed in it. The work is, uh, shows the amount of detail that you have and let's get started and have a look. Sounds great. So I hope you can see what I have on the screen. I have our opening slide. Can you see that? I so, can see it. Okay, <laughs> all right. So here we go. Let's start with this one, Isaac. And the reason we're gonna start with this is because in a way we're gonna end with it. I don't mean this is the last piece, but before we delve into your work in the, in the process, the history, where you started and why, let's look at one of the places you got to. Tell us yeah, about well, you talked about kavanah, you talked about text, you talked about a connection between art and our Jewish tradition. And I think this piece embodies a lot of that. Um, this is a representation of the priestly blessing that the Kohanim give. Uh, you may have recently seen this during the high holidays, for all I know, um, when the rabbis bless the congregation and say, Yivarechecha, Adonai, Vishmarecha, and so on and so forth. Um, it's a very Jewish gesture. It's one that we have been doing for thousands of years, uh, but many people know it from the television show Star Trek uh, because the actor Leonard Nimoy, who was playing an alien, a Vulcan, was asked to come up with some sort of a gesture for his alien people to make. And he talks about having remembered this gesture from being in temple. And he thought, wouldn't this be a great way for Vulcans to greet each other and say, live long and prosper, which is a sort of, adaptation of the blessing itself. So I decided to build this interpretation of that blessing and that gesture with cut up Star Trek comics so that it has both that Jewish gesture layer, the idea of the blessing and live long and prosper, but it is also populated by these comics that are, you know, a part of our 20th century American storytelling. And that's really what most of my work does. It views our text and our traditional stories through the lens of pop culture and comic books. So this piece, I understand, you actually gave this to William Shatner. Is that is that a true story? Uh, so it's a that's a different piece that I got to make for for William Shatner. Um, I, Shatner does have a print of my Live Long and Prosper in his house, but the original that he has is actually based on Lech Lecha. It's a lovely piece that features Vasquez rocks, which many of you will know from Captain Kirk's Battle with the Gorn. Uh, yeah, paper cutting is taking me some interesting places. So meeting William Shatner was certainly one of those. And I know he's a native Canadian, right? I believe so. All right, let's move on and have a look. So here we go. This is a, a mashup of what I imagine your brain to look like. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about your your comic book collection. Did you cut it up? Or do you still yeah. have, yeah. Yeah, I'm cutting up my childhood comic book collection. Uh, it's something that I did not start doing. I started cutting paper in the more traditional way of using colored papers and uh, different you know, handmade papers. That's usually what you see, or you'll see painted surfaces. Uh, but through a happy accident in my studio about uh, 15 years ago, I realized that I could combine my love of comic books, of the way they tell stories, the way they present them visually, uh, with what I was trying to do with the narrative and paper cutting, um, that there was a way to use these comics as a foil. Now, uh, for those of you who are familiar with Midrash and the Midrashic process, what that means is traditionally when we study a text in the Jewish tradition, we have a second text that we use as a, a lens to look through it. So you might say, here's this word in the book of Bereshit. I wanna know why it was chosen. Oh, well, it's in this other book and it's used in this other way. So we have a secondary text and that may be something from judges or something from the writings or something that a rabbi said in the Talmud. And that's how we interpret it. For me, my secondary text is comic books, using the narratives there, the storylines and the ideas which were in large part developed by Jews in the early 20th century in America, using those as my foil, as my lens through which to view our traditional narratives. And I, I absolutely, we'll get to that and we'll see how the text that you use reinforces the messaging of the piece. And that was really uh, actually 
very interesting to me when I started looking at your work was that, oh, if I look closer, oh, those words are really relevant. It's not just a bunch of pieces of paper put together. So now we're going to go back in time because as you mentioned, this is traditional paper cutting. Tell me about your beginnings. Tell me when the knife said, pick me up. So uh, yeah, these are some of my earliest pieces. And I think it's very clear two things. One is I was new to the form, uh, that I was a graphic designer approaching this form, and that I still didn't necessarily know what to do that was going to make my paper cuts really an expression of what was going on in my head. I had recently moved to Israel with my wife. So we had gotten married as she was finishing up college. She got accepted to Hebrew Union College and the first year of rabbinic school is in Jerusalem. So we packed up and moved to Jerusalem. So she had something to do. She was going to school every day. I needed something of my own. And having been a graphic designer and having actually recently purchased a ketubah from an artist who worked in cut paper, Deborah Band, I thought it might be fun to try my hand at this traditional art form, something that Jews have been doing for hundreds, if not thousands of years. So I found a little art store in Jerusalem and I bought a knife and I bought a cutting mat and some paper. And I started playing around with the traditional forms that you see in paper cuts. I would go and watch artists in their studios, uh, hang around and see what they were doing. Uh, Archie Grenote had his studio uh, in Jerusalem at the time and I got to watch him working. And so I started playing around with you know, straight lines, curvy lines, the things that I knew as a graphic designer, but bringing in uh, elements from our tradition. So there's Hebrew, there's the Ten Commandment tablets in the center, uh, there's a Noah's Ark reference going on in the right, playing with these traditional stories and seeing what I could do with them, really just as a lark, as, a, as an exploration at first. And then one day... <laughs> yeah, cut to, oh, you know, 10, 15 years of paper cutting later, when I finally found this combination that I could make. Um, my, my oldest kid at the time was just getting to that age where she was starting to read. And I thought, I wonder if she would enjoy comics the way that I did when I was a kid at her age. And so I had dragged some out. I was trying to find some good comic books she might enjoy. And I was in the studio, which at the time was just half of our garage. And I had some paper that I'd been cutting and I had the comics and it was one of those Reese's peanut butter cups moments for those of you who remember that 80s commercial where I realized there was something about the two of them together. And I tried playing with painting the textures that I saw in the comics. I tried blowing them up on a photocopier. Nothing really worked until I took the leap and I cut up a comic book and put the actual page behind what I was working with. And it just it just worked for me in so many ways. And this is really the earliest finished piece in which I incorporated comic books. It's a parting of the Red Sea. So these are the walls of the water that would surround the Israelites as they marched to freedom. And they're filled with comic books. I mean, it's as basic as, do I see water? It goes into the comic. And there are a few things here where you can see a crowd of people marching through from an old Wonder Woman comic. But it was really playing with, with the form, with the color, with the line, trying to use it as a way to better create this, this experience, I wanted the person who looked at this piece to feel like, oh, that's what it would have been like. When the rabbis say it was like walking between two walls of water, this is what they meant. And I'm it's, still very pleased with this really early piece, even now. Still fresh, Isaac, yeah. still fresh. I think so. It's got such power to it because of the harmony of the colors and the almost monochromatic sense of the blue tones. But now we're about to see a very powerful collection. So tell us about this collection. Yeah, this is me really getting into my stride. Uh, these are selections from my Paper to Fila series. Uh, it's a series of 16 cuts based on the modern American reform Jewish prayer service, uh, morning and evening prayers all mixed together. And the, the pieces are all 18 by 24 inches, uh, not centimeters. I know you Canadians use metric, we're not there yet. So 18 inches by 24 inches. And they are all an attempt for me to convey my sense of what saying these words, what praying these prayers is like. Trying to capture what's in my head emotionally, what I'm thinking about in terms of our connection to the divine, um, what I think about and how, 
how I can use these, these stories about superheroes and about superpowered beings as a way to sort of sideways get into thinking about the divine, about God. It's really, uh, first of all, I love, I have to say, I love the graphic elements, the, the white areas that people can notice that there's positive and negative space and that the positive space are the white lines and the negative is where Isaac is infilled with either color. And I, I challenged him when we were talking about this. I said, come on, that's not a comic book over here. And he said, yeah, it is. It's, he's pretty true to the medium. And here's a couple of blow ups of this. So talk to me about this one. It looks like a lot of people talking and then I see through it and I see Hebrew letters. Mm -hmm. so what's yeah, going so on? Each of the pieces in the series actually incorporates bits and pieces of old prayer books that were destined for ritual burial in the Geniza, um, as we Jews do. Um, I, so again, my wife's a rabbi. I had special access to the Geniza box and with permission, grabbed a volume or two, which I then incorporated into the work as a way of connecting what I was doing to those prayer books and maybe giving those pages a little more life before they were um, interred in the cemetery. Um, so yes, what you're seeing on the left are selections of the Barhu prayer, um, as well as some musical versions of it as well. Um, what I'm trying to convey with this, there's this sense that the Barhu is the moment when we all start praying together. It's the call to worship. So the surrounding colorful area are all of those conversations that go on. Remember back in the day when we would all get together in a room to pray together? Uh, and there'd be all those conversations. You'd schmooze a little bit. Oh, how have you been? I haven't seen you in a week. What do you think they'll have at the Oneg? All these separate conversations going on until the Barhu starts and the Chazan or the Cantor or the Rabbi or whoever calls out to those opening words to the prayer and we all stop and as a congregation we respond and that's what those two main lighter speech bubbles in the center are it's the call and response of the barhu in which all of our separate voices come together and we are unified they're still all there it's still all of our separate voices but in this in this journey together as we pray together as a community that's what i was trying to get to with this structure I think you got there. I think it's incredibly powerful. I mean, the thought, the word brilliant came into my mind when you were saying these things. I mean, what a brilliant idea to have this function on so many levels. I do have to ask you one crazy question, though. How do you feel cutting up a piece of religious text? I mean, just curious, because I know that whenever I have leftover sheet music from some choral thing, and I, I see it in the backseat of my car, I feel guilty. And it, I feel like I should say, do something. I can't put this in the garbage. What, how do you feel cutting this up? So these are not pristine prayer books pulled from, you know, the, uh, the pews at the temple. These are things that were water damaged, uh, fire damaged, things that had you know, survived maybe the 1994 earthquake we had out here, but just barely and clearly could no longer be used. It was it was disrespectful to the books in many ways to keep them around, you know, in this horrible state in the same way that you don't let a, a flag, um, you know, hang, you know, when it's got tears and rips or whatever. You're not supposed to do that. Well, these that's why we bury these books, um, why we show them that respect. So what I was doing is finding the pieces of those books that could still be used, that could still have a message and a connection for us. So I, I feel fairly strongly that what I was doing was, um, it was a respectful treatment of these elements of the books for something that could no longer be used by the community. And then the I rest of it goes back to the Geniza. I definitely think that you've given honor to these pieces by elevating them to art. I, I wanna just ask you for two seconds in case people don't know, can you quickly just say what a Geniza is? Oh yeah, so a Geniza is the uh, the repository for old holy books. Jews, when you have a book that is damaged in some way, you don't just throw it out, you have to bury it. Um, and that's what the Geniza is. It's this ritual burial of these books. And it takes place usually in a Jewish cemetery. Most cemeteries have a place where you can do this. The books are buried in the same way that you would bury a human um, as a sign of respect. Thank you. So now we wanna talk a little bit about your process. Mm -hmm. I love this because it's obviously something you've done to illustrate because people must say, how the heck do you get all these layers working together? So talk us through this. It's, it's really just four easy things. Uh, I start with text. That's what you see on the far most uh, panel there. That's a little bit of really blown up text from my tiny little chumash uh, reading about Revelation, the Jews at the foot of Mount Sinai. There's 
uh, noise and there's lightning and there's this shofar like sound. Um, so that's the text. That's where I always start. Something in the text has to intrigue me, has to engage me, has to challenge me. Maybe I like it. Maybe I disagree with it. It's often that I have a disagreement with a traditional interpretation, but something there catches my eye and my brain. From there, it's sketching. As I said, I go to the sketchbook, I've got a pencil, start very tiny usually, maybe it's an inch or two tall. Often my sketches can get much larger depending on the detail that I want to put in there, trying to figure out what form will this take. In this case, trying to get that shape of cyanide, but really focusing on the sort of wavy, smoky lines above it. Once I've sketched it out, I go to the big paper and I cut it out. So you'll see all those black spaces are simulating the removed portions of the heavy duty watercolor stock that I cut up, the white being what's left behind. You get this framework. Then it's into my childhood comic book collection to find the right pieces to tell my story. So in this case, I was thinking about the Jews at the foot of Sinai, hearing the voice of God, feeling that fear and awe and trembling that the Torah tells us they experienced. And there's this wonderful speech bubble that says, you follow me now. And it's actually made with this character who wields a yellow ring, which is powered by fear, which is that emotion that the Torah tells us we Israelites were feeling. And I thought, what a great stand-in for the divine voice. So I cut that up. I cut up some clouds. I cut up some lightning. They all get tucked in behind that paper cut layer as a collage. And on the right, you see what that becomes. In this case, it's a, it's a revelation piece called Follow Me. Beautiful. It's a, an amazing process that involves you being engaged at every level. It's not like- Jonah, I'm Jonah just nailed that Sinestro and the Sinestro core have those yellow rings. That's right. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> oh, I'm looking at the chat here. Someone is pointing out which comics I'm using and which characters, and it's just awesome. So oh, that's glad funny. to have other comics nerds joining us. Oh, they, there are a few here. One of them <laughs> might be someone I know well. Let's move on and have a look at another collection. So what what is this? Because you, you do these collections that they are not standalone pieces, but they belong together. I mean, they work on their own, as we'll look, uh, we'll see. But what is this collection? This is my paper Mishnah series. So there are six orders or books of the Mishnah, uh, Sitre Mishnah, each of them dealing with a different part of Jewish law. So uh, from the upper left, there's seeds, which is about agricultural laws. Um, and this is an aerial view of fields like you might get out of an airplane. Again, remember the old days when we would get into an airplane. And look at it. Yeah. Uh, so each of them deal with different aspects of Jewish ritual and law. Um, there's festival in the uh, top middle, which deals with the cycles of the planets, right? The earth rotates around the sun, and that's how we determine when festivals come. So I have the sun and the, the inner planets. Uh, Nashim is the one at the right there, and it's about women and men and interpersonal relations. And so I've symbolized that with the old shtetl wedding ring, you know, the little house on top of it. Mm. Um, so each of them has this particular aspect, but because they're all about law, they all use in large part two comic book characters, Daredevil and She-Hulk, both of whom are lawyers by day and superhero vigilantes by night. And I love the idea that, you know, they had these, these two powers going for them, not just the, you know, punch bad guys thing, but also the, the intelligence uh, and the will to become lawyers and to use the legal system to help people who need it. Well, here's a couple details of the series. And what I love about it is that you don't actually have to know those backstories in order to get the impact because these are very structured geometric pieces. They're not uh, free form like we saw at the Dead Sea. These are very, these have a symmetry to them. So you're obviously making a message here about perhaps law and about uh, rules, and then within these windows, exploding with color. Would you say that would be apt? Oh, for sure. So on the left, this is the book of damages, and I represented it as this faceted sapphire gem for a few reasons. One, there's a midrash that tells us that the Ten Commandments were not carved in stone at the top of Sinai, but in fact were carved into gigantic sapphire tablets. So I loved the idea that this could be a reference to that midrash, but also the fact that sapphires don't, don't come out of the earth in this polished fashion. They're rough stones, right? In order to make them perfect and beautiful, you have to chisel away. You have to 
you have to damage the stone to get it to be in this perfected form. And that's really what I think laws tend to do. They take this raw experience of humanity and they try to shape it into something that is beautiful in which we can all exist together. So that's what I'm trying to do here is convey that. I hope the form, the color, that you know that that all works to tell the story even if you don't know comics but certainly if you do it's it's fun to see matt murdoch's eye popping out there in his little glasses talking about the meaning of the law um there's there's so much fun for me in combining my love of comics and my love of jewish text and it's it's a sh it's shock it's a shock because it's it's works so well i want to ask you about the process how long would you say I mean, proportionately. So, I, I mean, you get the idea of the graphic and you, you know the impact you want to have, but mm -hmm. is it hard to find the, the comic images that you want? Yeah, oh, it's, it, it, can be, it can be a very challenging process because even these, I designed all six pieces ahead of time as sketches before I started cutting anything because they needed to work together. And they all do. There's, as you said, that symmetry, uh, there's a circle element that goes throughout all of them that sort of ties them together. And even knowing that I was going to use particular characters, Daredevil and She-Hulk, when it came down to finding pieces to fit in these, these windows, these openings, um, the, the windows were not designed for particular bits of comic. I have to find comics right. or collage them together like Tesserae to fill those spaces. Right. And so I do find these pieces. Part of my process is the search for the right bit of comic, the right speech bubble or the right character, the right thing to come through. Um, and as I proceed through it, sometimes I'll find something I like more an hour or a week later, and I go back in and cover it up. And many of these pieces have three, four, five or more layers sometimes in various areas. It's almost like a tell, right? One of those, those archaeological digs where you can see civilization on top of civilization on top of civilization, because I'm just trying to get closer to this thing in my head. And sometimes it takes a while. I bet you have files that say burning bushes, um, or do you? Do you have files with categories? I do. I do. So in addition to my long boxes, you comic nerds know those are these long boxes filled with comics. When a comic gets so cut up that it can't go back in there, I will grab useful pieces and put them in these files that I have over here. So I have one that's got lightning. I have one that's marked fire. I have one that's marked water. And that's where those scraps go in so that if I need something, I can grab it out of there. And usually I've labeled what comic it comes from because it's very important to me which comics they come from what characters are being used i write on the back of each piece what comics i cut up to build them because for me yeah it's sometimes really important that to know oh did this come from a traditional hero did this come from a villain or from a villain who has reformed and become a hero are these female characters are they male characters are they gender neutral what's their backstory all of that helps me tell the story that I'm trying to explore from our tradition. Awesome. So now we're looking at something you did not make. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I love bringing this up first, though. We've all seen this sort of representation of the 12 tribes uh, in synagogues, in community centers, uh, all over the place. These are the 12 tribes of Israel. It's mosaic stone. Um, I like to put this up here because it was one of the inspirations, not this one in particular, but the traditional representation for my series of 12 tribes, which, which I know is the right next now. slide. There so we see, go. There, there's the 12 slides with a bang. <laughs> <laughs> this is I mean, like, they, oh yeah, I'm going to show you the 12 tribes. And they, you know, they use the traditional iconography for those tribes that we've seen. So, um, you know, we have uh, Shimon and the palace gates, or we have Judah as the lion, or we have, um, you know, Zebulon, the seafaring people, um, Issachar as the sun and the moon. So these are traditional ways that we have talked about and tried to explain the tribes. But what I've done is, as I do, fill them with comic books and specifically minority superheroes, not the big Superman and Spider-Man that everybody knows, but characters that are perhaps less well known, less well heard of, uh, really trying to capture what it meant to be a people. So the story of the 12 tribes that we read about in the Torah is that it's the 12 sons of Jacob, right? And they all decide to, they get out of Israel and they move, they get out of Egypt, they move to Israel and they set up camp there and they all live together. 
What we know historically, though, is that the Jewish people, the Israelites, really come from different places. They're not just tribes of brothers. And so this is a representation of that diversity. And it's, for me, an exploration of what it means to be an American as well, that we come from different places. We choose to live together as a people. I made these just after the 2016 election in America, in North America, the United States. Uh, which is to the south if you're in Canada. And um, for me, it was about trying to find a way back to that, that idea of chosen people. We choose to be a people, we choose to live together. And I think the, all the graphics create a harmony. Your pieces all sit together nicely. It's not like oddballs. They have a whole, um, they have a way of living together graphically. And I think that that's what's hugely successful. But I know there's a story behind this one. There is. So this is the 13th piece in the 12 Tribes series, and it represents Dina, Jacob's daughter. Now, her story is a brutal and vicious one in the Torah. She is raped um, by, uh, by non-Israelites. And we don't talk about her as one of the tribes. She sort of gets left out of that story other than this one thing. And in fact, when the rabbis explain the story. They talk about how she was so beautiful that Jacob, her dad, had to keep her in a box because otherwise men would want her and that could be dangerous. So she had to be confined in this box. That's where her symbol comes from. I've represented her as a box. But one day while being carried around in this box, uh, her exposed arm is seen and it is so beautiful. That is what instigates the rape. And this idea that the rabbis have, that it's her beauty that is the fault for this violence against her, uh, that she is the victim, but that it's her fault, right? And that's why she had to be in a box. I mean, I find that to be demeaning and misogynistic and horrible. And so I've made this box out of villainous quotes about women. There's a lot of swearing going on here. <laughs> There's some really, uh, really heinous stuff in here, as well as female heroes who have been kept in those boxes and how they try to escape. And you can see Wonder Woman's exposed arm there, a symbol of strength and power and pride and not of being a victim. So yeah, for me, this is as important as any of the other 12 and possibly the most important. Well, speaking of women, now we're going to go to another series that you've done mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. women. And speak to us about these the women that we see here. Sure. And I, I'm so glad we left on the uh, Vaikra Rabbah here because we just came through Sukkot when you invite Ushpizin guests into your Sukkah. These are the four matriarchs, the Ushpizot that you could invite in. So from the left, Sarah, then Rebecca, then Leah and Rachel. These are also really large pieces. Um, they're about two feet tall just of their heads. And I wanted to play with these expressions that we have of you know, the representing the four species from Sukkot, but also their stories, which, you know, we tend to say Abraham and Sarah. Uh, we say Isaac and Rebecca, right? We always put the, the guy's name, the husband's name first. And it's always the guy's story that seems to take precedence. And I really wanted to play with these, these women's stories, which I think are just as key to our history. We just have to remember that they're there. We have to reread them and understand them and make them relevant. And so I'm playing with the idea of, you know, Sarah as this woman who pushes into the unknown, you know, and Rebecca as this woman who's kind to animals and really is the brains of the family. Um, I'm showing you I mean, the scale. Yeah, so here you can see them in a gallery. This is in Cleveland um, at the Temple Tiferet Israel. Yeah, where we actually put out magnifying glasses for people to get up close and see those portraits together. You can see them here interspersed with the patriarchs as well. I think that your commitment to introducing themes of justice, themes of pop, taking pop culture and taking people who are larger than life really comes through in some of these portraits that you've done. So Thank tell you. me a bit about these. Uh, interesting that you have some Hebrew here in this one. Yeah, so um, I'll, then I'll start with, yeah, on the right, that's Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And I have some text there that she uh, famously had up on the wall of her office, you know, at the Supreme Court. Um, but she and Golda Meir on the left, these are both made with specifically uh, female Jewish superheroes. So people like Kitty Pride, uh, Sabra, who's the woman in blue and white with that enormous Jewish star 
on her chest. I mean, it's as gaudy as Captain America's outfit for sure. Um, but trying to play with these ideas about strength, about women's strength, and about how we tend to see that coupled with wisdom in a way we don't always need to with men. Um, male superheroes are very often, if they're strong, that's their big thing, like Thor, right? Thor is strong, he is not by any means an intellectual, but we tend to see our female heroes as combining strength with, with something more so that they get up to that level. And I don't know if that's because they need to be more than the men to compete on that you know, level playing field, but whatever it is, I wanted to have all of those aspects here. So Gold to My Ear, this piece is named Mayor Fight um, because you can actually see Kitty Pride talking about how sometimes that's what you need to do. And she was, you know, not just this grandmotherly, you know, head of state for Israel, the first, the first female prime minister, but also, you know, she was a fighter. She was a scrapper. Um, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, right, those eyes when she was dissenting with an opinion, um, you knew she meant business. And I've got She-Hulk's eye in there, again, the lawyer superhero, because I really wanted to see if I could capture a little bit of that, that emotion and you know, convey a little bit of how I felt about her and her legacy. I think you've really done a great job of marrying that sense of power with wisdom that these women had, and that is their superpower, really, in a way. And now I'm going to show how good you are at, in a few lines, capturing a person's face. I mean, everybody has two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. So <laughs> the miracle is how you can take the few lines that you have and have them represent familiar faces and yeah, I think you know and it's it's always a bit of a, a cold shower to go from Golda Meir and Ruth Bader Ginsburg to these guys um but yeah some of my work gets a little angry and I'm really trying to see how much can I convey as you say with just a few lines my my kids tend to be way better at all the things I want to do um, right, you, you try and do these things and they're like, oh, that's so easy. Um, so one in particular, you know, can just get that emotion with a few simple lines. I'm trying to do that here on the left with uh, former Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, and on the right, uh, former uh, reality TV show, TV show host, uh, Donald Trump. Um, they're both made with comics that express my sense of their legacy. So on the right, those are comics that are about fear and anger. Um, and I'm going to get a little political. I feel like that was much of what uh, Netanyahu's, you know, uh, rule was about, was about making people angry and afraid. Um, and on the right, you can see Donald Trump's hair is made out of hospital beds lined up going off into infinity, um, as well as the word mine, you can see in his cheek there, made with some comics that represent greed, self-centeredness. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, sometimes some of this paper cutting gets a little angry. <laughs> as long as you don't cut yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to, here's another piece that is very interesting because it's political statement for you. And it's not an old piece, is it? Um, actually, no. So this is one of my, uh, my pandemic pieces um, inspired by these, uh, these moms in Portland, Oregon, who were marching, wearing yellow. I don't know if you saw any of the photos from this. You know, but we were having in America, we continue to have these conversations about race and about justice and about rights. And we saw an explosion of populist movements of people trying to bring attention to injustice, um, to the murder of black people by police, for instance, uh, which continues to this day. And I was just inspired by these women out on the streets wearing their masks. Um, this piece was actually picked up by a collector who I think has joined us today on this call. So I'm pleased to see Randy here. Um, but for me, this was about celebrating anger and celebrating wisdom. It's actually inspired by a verse from Psalms uh, about wisdom and its voice being heard in the streets. Um, so again, starting with a little bit of Jewish text, uh, taking a little bit of pop culture, which is what's going on right now in our world and fusing the two together to explore my feelings about, you know, what I'm seeing out there. I think it's got a lot of power. That's, as I said, when I, we started, it operates on a lot of different levels, the graphic elements, the color, the text, it all combines for a singular message. I want to remind people and invite them to pose questions to Isaac in the chat. In a few minutes after we do his next series, we're going to take questions. So if you haven't already posed your questions in the chat, and now we go. 
to the uh, golem. The golems make their appearance. Yep. And uh, uh, this needs this needs a lot of explanation for me. <laughs> I can do it really simply. So yeah, I was playing with these. You saw the portrait of Trump. You saw the picture of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the protests. These are all things that were going on, you know, over this pandemic year and a half that we were experiencing. 2020, right? We will not forget that one. Um, but I was having these ideas about safety and about protection as I was feeling the exact opposite. I was feeling this anxiety about the world. Um, we had started these lockdowns in March 2020 here in America, and I was feeling unsafe. And when Jews feel unsafe, one of the things that we do is we play around with the story of the golem. Now, you uh, probably are familiar with modern day versions of this, like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Uh, but in essence, the golem is this creature made from mud or earth with some kind of Jewish magic or mysticism. Perhaps it's an incantation or a spell or the writing of a word across its forehead, but some sort of Jewish magic echoing God's creation of humans, as we see in Psalms, which is where we first have the word golem. Golemi is my unformed limbs. Um, it comes from Jewish text. And so I started making these golems who are supposed to protect us from danger. That's the golem's job. Uh, when there is uh, anti-Semitism or some other kind of danger, you build the golem and the golem protects the Jews. And then when its job is done, the golem can be disassembled or deactivated or whatever. Um, so I started making these golems with uh, my little cut up comic books, some of them about the pandemic, some of them about uh, social justice, some of them about women's rights, some of them about the elections, um, just golem after golem after golem. And uh, I found that eventually, I mean, what I have now, these golems are 12 by 12. So one foot square, um, these are much larger, but I've got 60 of these square foot golems and then 72 of them in total that I made over the course of 18 months that all represent, in essence, it's, it's a pandemic diary. It's my personal experiences, the things that I needed at any particular time made into a golem that could protect me, you know, figure. So, so there's a bit of magic involved here, mm -hmm. would you say? I, I mean, I think so. That's what golems are all about. It's like a totem in a way, so mm -hmm. that you can put all of your fears and your hopes and your power into these shapes, I'm imagining. Yeah, and it was it was such a pleasure. So there was this dip in the late summer where it felt like we, we'd all gotten vaccinated here in the States. Well, many of us had gotten vaccinated and we were feeling like the numbers were dropping. And my wife and I had the opportunity to go over to Israel. Uh, for a very short trip, but I had a little pop-up show in Jerusalem at Kol Ha'ot in Chutzot Yotzer in the artist's district. I brought prints of all the golems, well, many of the golems, um, and it was wonderful to be back in Jerusalem. I started cutting paper there in the 90s. That's where I had my first show, and to have another show to be the first place where I really showed any of these golems um, and talked about them, and uh, I was even able to pull off the mask a little bit and talk a little bit, as you can see in these pictures. Um, it was really a pleasure to, to talk with people about their feelings and their anxieties, but also their sources of strength, where they were finding some sense of protection, you know, from engaging with our stories and our texts. And yeah, I, I like to think the golems became the beginnings of conversations. And I just want to show this before we go to questions, because we're, we're almost at that time. I just want to show some of the elements of your work that have been turned into architectural installations mm -hmm. and how apt they are for that kind of a thing. Yeah, and I think this is because my work hues so closely to the text that it works in a Jewish environment. Um, so whether it's you know the burning bush being translated into arc doors in the upper left, or parts of the Tefillah series. The Tefillah series lives at Temple Israel in Memphis, but these are um, from Adath Jeshrun in Kentucky. They did these gigantic prints on metal um, for the entryway for their synagogue. Um, and on the right, some, some windows that I designed for a school in Portland, Oregon, um, a sort of you know, colored adaptation of some of the work. It's really fun to see it larger, to create an experience where someone can be not just in front of the work, but feeling like they're in the story that I'm that I'm exploring with it. So it's the a, bigger it really, pieces are so much more fun because of that, because I can create a space. So it's larger than life, really. And and before we go to questions, I'm just going to show 
the man in his studio and there he is and I feel like you're uh, Lex Luthor or some um, well that's probably I don't know if you're <laughs> a bad one to pick are you Superman what you are is a connoisseur of the comic and of the uh, superpower that you have to bring us all of these dimensions to understanding your work and to understanding your kavana. And with that, I want to invite Michelle to um, unmute and open her camera, turn her camera on, and to share with us some of the questions that we have for Isaac. Well, thank you again. And there are a few questions. And if anybody else has questions, they can still put them in the chat and hopefully we can get to them. So the first question is, do you do anything to the comic book paper that will protect it and make it archival? You know, I get asked that a lot. Um, people are very concerned because you know what happens to paper, right? We all have older books or older things that sort of fall apart. Paper is burning. That is its very nature. It's exposure to oxygen. And my scientist children would probably laugh that I was describing it this way, but that's what's happening. It is oxidizing, it is burning, and that's why paper goes from white to yellow. And you see that in the comics. A lot of my work incorporates new comics and old comics together. Um, and some of them have been well handled over the years. A lot of these are comics that I've read over and over again. Do I preserve them when I finish the piece? I tried at first. I used some Mod Podge and varnishes to protect it. And what I got was this, this shiny plasticky thing that just, it, it ruined the source material. It felt like something that, it was like having a toy in a box instead of playing with it. There's nothing wrong with it, but it wasn't what I was going for. I wanted people to really see the textures of the papers and to feel like they were in the presence of the source material. And so I've chosen not to protect them in the same way that you look at, you know, an old Robert Rauschenberg combine, which is made of pieces of newspaper and stuff that he found in the yard. And it's just aging. Um, it, it gets older and older and more brittle. These pieces won't necessarily do that. I always try and encourage people, don't put them in direct sunlight, um, frame them with UV glass if you can, as you would with any original art. Um, but they are going to age with us. So our stories get older and we revisit them and they mean something new. Our art gets older and we look at it afresh with new eyes. And this art gets older as we get older. Fair enough. Just processing that, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I appreciate that. Um, another question, what does the character of Ben Grimm represent to you? Now, yeah. this will show that I don't know my comics, so. Quite, quite all right. So he showed up in a few things that we featured here in the slideshow, including one of the golems. Um, ben Grimm is one of the Fantastic Four, created by two Jewish guys, uh, Stanley Lieber and Jacob Kurtzberg, who you probably know as Stanley and Jack Kirby, back in the 60s, really the first of the Marvel comics as we know them today. They were a family of heroes, very neurotic, and Ben Grimm was the avatar for Jack Kirby. Um, he's this strong, you know, sort of brooding, rock-like character, very golem-like in his appearance, and is a canonically Jewish superhero in Marvel comics. You'll see it in some of the movies too. Uh, the reason he keeps coming back here is I really like playing with these Jewish characters. They are a stand-in for me and for our people. I mean, to be fair, the comic book industry as we know it in America in the 20 and 21st centuries was just, you know, created by Jews, Jewish writers, Jewish artists. So, so many of the story elements and the ways that we tell stories are Jewish in nature. But there are a few characters like Ben Grimm, like Kitty Pride, like um, Willow. Oh, I've got to share. I'm not plugging a book. But Willow Zimmerman is the latest Jewish hero in Gotham City. Um, she was written by a woman named E. Lockhart. They just came out with this great graphic novel, Whistle, and her Jewish experience informs her story as a hero in the same way that Ben Grimm's does. The reason that he is a hero is because of what his Judaism has taught him. And I just, I love that. I, that's, that's so meaningful to me to see myself represented in these stories. So much to learn. And this passion is so infectious, which leads to this question, that if you, there's so many superhero heroes, if you could invite one of them into your home for a visit, 
who would that be and what might that evening look like? Wow, that is a, that's a great post to co question again, when you're supposed to, you know, metaphorically, theoretically invite guests, you know, from past and present into your sukkah to eat with you. Um, who would I invite into my sukkah? I mean, it, or who, you know, into my home to have a conversation with, not just the sukkah. That's a tough one. Um, I'd want to have them all. There's something about the interplay between heroes that makes them particularly interesting, not just working by themselves, but as members of a team. So Ben Grimm is great. But what makes him interesting is the way that he interacts with his best friend Reed and Reed's wife Sue and her kid brother Johnny, the four of them as a family, or, you know, not just Superman, but the whole Justice League. Um, not just, you know, one of the Avengers, but all of them. It's the way that they connect to each other as a community community that fascinates me. So I I definitely want to bring, I don't know, would it be Wanda and the Vision? You know, I, I'd love to talk to them. I'd love to talk to Cap and Bucky. Um, Although I do have, you know, my, my grandmother, uh, Bubbles here, lives nearby. She's 91, and she has the same stories that Steve Rogers has. So um, I, I'd, I'd need room for a bunch. It would probably be the X-Men. They were my first comic book love. Uh, these misfit mutants, some of them teenagers, um, Kitty Pride, one of them Jewish, um, who have to figure out how to survive in a world that doesn't always understand or welcome them. I'd be curious to know how you get through that how you remain an outsider, remain true to where you come from, but nonetheless become a part of the surrounding world. I think you're going to need a bigger sukkah. <laughs> Probably. Michelle, do you have one more? Sure. Rabbi Peretz, who is one of our artists from last season, asked, do you know about Joe Milgram's handmade midrash workshop in visual theology? We all owe her so much. So maybe you can share yeah. a little bit about that. Yeah, um, I'm pretty sure so that, uh, that Joe Milgram did the torn paper midrash is what Peretz is referring to. And that's, yes, for sure. I, we owe so much to the people who have done this before us. Right? We talk about standing on the shoulders of giants. That's such a great phrase. But art and midrash in Judaism, I think especially so. Because what I'm doing, if what I'm doing is midrash, and I call it paper midrash, if it's part of that conversation about understanding our texts and interpreting them to be relevant to us right now, this is something Jews have done for our, our entire history. What I'm doing is a, a response to what not just rabbis, but regular everyday Jews have done forever. Um, I'm just part of the continuum, and theoretically, people after me will be part of that conversation as well. So we owe so much to the people who worked before us. Peretz is one of my mentors. I know Peretz talks about his mentors. Um, you know, we talk about these people whose work has influenced us and made us want to create and made us want to become more involved with our tradition. And, um, you know, it's uh, my, my wife, the rabbi, has this great phrase where she always says, you know, I was taught this by so-and-so, that you always preface teaching in that way so that you carry on the traditions before you. And I think that's so key. Thank you so much for taking the time to answer the questions. I want to ask you before we move on to our closing, what are you working on now? What's next for you? What's coming up? Uh, my big thing really is going to be in January. I am going to be premiering an exhibition of these 72 golems here in Los Angeles. It'll be the first time they're all seen in one place. And so much of my time is being spent right now making sure that that exhibition is going to be perfect like people are going to show up and we'll wear masks and it'll be safe and we'll talk about art again i'm really looking forward to that um but in the meantime yeah i mean back here uh cutting paper all the time i'm playing around with some ideas about uh bialik's poetry so my my antecedent Chaim nachman bialik is a great poet i've been playing around with a series inspired by his poetry um i've been playing around with some more ideas driven by uh, these you know, stories we keep coming back to every year. It's the same stories in temple and every year they mean something new to us. And I keep hoping I will find some, some greater insight. So a lot more cutting up comics, golem exhibition on the way. And, uh, and who knows, you know, I always encourage people to follow me on Instagram because I will usually put sketches and you know, in process pictures out there. It's great to share with the community and see what people think. So, and I believe Michelle is posting in the chat a way for people to reach you if they want to, uh, have a look or a conversation about your work more in person with you and I want to thank you so much for sharing your story your work your 
ideas about community, about togetherness, about safety, all of that has formed an impression on us, I know I can speak for all of us, of an amazing body of work. And thank you so much for enlightening us. Thank you for having me, Shelley. You know, um, when I saw uh, Rabbi uh, uh, Wolf Parents Prasan, when I saw Rachel Braun finishing out last season, I was so impressed by their work. To be included in that uh, group is very meaningful to me. So thank you. Thank you all for making this happen. And thank you everyone who came tonight. We're, we're so grateful to have you, Isaac, and we, we want to stay in touch. And before we, before I say goodnight and let us go, I want to let the people here know a couple things that they could pay attention to. On the Consequences of Hate Speech is a virtual art show that can be reached through VectorArtistInitiative.com. I want to thank you so much to my dear friends at Vector Artist Initiative who helped to promote Isaac's show. I encourage you to visit the exhibition. It's really quite powerful and worth your time.